Welcome, everyone. It's good to see so many faces which are largely awake on a Thursday morning session at Revo. Um, as Ed said, today, today's about the online halo and the role of stores in driving spend across every channel. But it's also about a bit more than that. It's about you guys. It's about all of us. It's about consumers, shoppers, and retail property professionals. We are in uncertain times at the moment. And the sector faces challenges of an unprecedented level. On the surface, the narrative is pretty clear. And we've all seen the headlines. God knows we've seen the headlines. It's a well-worn trope, a beloved of writers who've got copy to fill. Falling footfall, declining sales, death of the high street. Online shopping is killing physical retail. And to be fair, that one's quite novel. Shops are the servants of the online shopping world. Google even has one of their handy people also ask boxes for online is killing retail. And over 13 million records for you to uh, enjoy at your leisure. And there's no doubt that that role of the store is changing and that we are all operating in very tough times. But this self reinforcing narrative that online is killing the store is tired, it's dated, and frankly, we should know better. Ed referred to this before, and naturally, we would take the position, and I actually think most of you would agree with this, that how we as consumers behave means that the store is driving online. Online is not killing the store. In fact, the store is driving online sales. I'm going to wait a moment to let that sort of sink in a little bit into any fuzzy heads out there, because um, it's uncharacteristically positive in terms of the sentiment at this time. But it is something that we have categorically proven to be true. And I'm going to hit you with a great big stat, because as Ed says, that's what we do. We like to put numbers on things. 106%. Online sales are 106% higher inside a store's catchment than they are outside of it. Stores are driving online sales up. So what does that actually mean, you know, a percentage, particularly one that's over 100% is a bit, well, it means that for every pound spent online outside a store's catchment, two pounds and six pence, two pounds and six pence is spent online inside the store's catchment. And even though that catchment flexes by brand, so reflecting the difference between a Boots and a John Lewis, the trend does not. The size of the halo a brand generates varies by sector and demographic, but the fact remains there is a halo across the board, across every category and across all the different demographic groups. And don't forget, in addition to that extra online sale that the catchment is generating, that extra one pound and six pence of online sales driven by the store, you have the money generated by the store itself. So this has really clear implications for any retailers who are contemplating store closure programs. Because the loss in sales is not just in the till, but also in online as well. Something I think we could say is probably being felt by Mothercare, who have seen declining sales both on and offline as they've done their store closures. And it, implies, it applies to everybody who is considering a store closure program. And let's be honest, most retailers are in that position at the moment. But when you look at it like this, this becomes a bit more of a good news story. And it does jar a little with the whole retail apocalypse um, tone that we sort of saw at the beginning and the pressures I think everyone is probably feeling. And we, we, we can't deny that retail is in a tough space to operate in. But again, as I said, laying the blame online is too simplistic. We are all consumers, and consumers are complex things. And to give you an idea of that complexity and how interrelated all of this is in terms of consumer behavior, I'm going to touch on a couple of key themes, which I think also will hopefully give the panel some food for thought. So the first one is not, there we go. Um, millennials. Millennials are increasingly becoming responsible adults with families. And that is in turn accelerating the decline in footfall. And the rate of change is leaving all the institutions which govern us and provide that framework for retail and property behind. And that, in turn, is significantly preventing investment and innovation that's desperately needed to turn those millennials back on. Now, I might seem like I made some pretty big leaps there, so I'm going to expand on that a little bit. If we start with that point around millennials, it's still used a little bit as a catch-all term to talk about young people, but we're in a position today where actually over 50% of the population is under 38, and they are all classed as millennials, or they're younger than that. They're Gen Z, or whatever the latest generation is called, Generation AA, 
little Excel gag for the geeks out there. And I say these not to throw around those generation buzzwords, because it's very easy to do. But the point about these people who are 38 and under is that they have all grown up with digital technology literally in their hands. For them, they see no distinction between on and offline. And we see that in their behaviors. They are continuously moving between the two. Whereas actually, older groups tend to still perceive on and offline as two different places. We've all spent, and let's be frank, spent the last 10 years playing a form of bullshit bingo with millennials, talking about avocados and digital nativism. But there is a wider point here. These shoppers are coming of age. Sorry, this one behind me is slightly disconcerting. Um, these shoppers are coming of age, so they've got mortgages, they've got kids, they've got careers. And what happens to people as they get older is that their core values and habits remain, but their needs change. So as they move into parenthood, they still value authenticity. They still behave digitally. But now they need everything cheaper, they need it faster, and they need it more conveniently. And going to the shops with small children is a chore, not a pleasure, believe me. That's what the internet does well. And we can see this in footfall. There are any number of sources um, that count footfall. Most of them are in this conference hall today. The only thing that they are all in agreement on is that footfall is falling. And we can see that in our data. So across more than 800,000 surveys we've done, we can see that the frequency of visit is declining. But what you don't see in that high-level footfall data is that footfall is not falling equally. The groups which are declining fastest are 35 to 44-year-olds. Those with families, those who are more time pressured, with less disposable income, and those who are increasingly digitally fluent. Or as the Amazon strapline, Prime strapline puts it, time and money, we save you both. And that shifting footfall is not because physical retail is disappointing people or isn't delivering. It's actually quite the opposite. What we're seeing is people are shopping less, but they're actually enjoying it more. So net promoter score, um, so it's a measure of whether someone would recommend a place to their friends, is actually up 30% since 2014 when we asked people in the center, would you recommend this place to their friends? It's up 30%. Catering spend and leisure trips have increased every year since 2014. And last year, we actually saw leisure trips specifically were up 17%. So we see that people are still visiting centers, but increasingly, it's the youngest shoppers and the oldest shoppers who have more time and arguably more discretionary income who are driving that visitation. And they're changing what they use those centers for. So it's not just about retail. It's about place. And it's about engaging in place as an activity that is more than just shopping. And with that, I think we can say that what people want from place has changed. So we are past this age of mass consumerism. It, we would argue now it's all about localism or hyperlocalism. Because when the internet is offering speed, time, and convenience, then the physical retail needs to deliver something else. Engagement, interest, community. And the approach for owners then becomes quite clear. Be innovative. If you have existing dead space or vacant space, use it to innovate. Use it to incubate local operators who want to start a business. Look after them. Offer support in marketing. Give them a 100% turnover deal that shares that risk but allows them to find their feet in that market. When they become established, you'll have created a space that inspires other brands, including those brands which have the better covenants, which are willing to commit to the longer leases. And then watch as those retails prosper and that investment cycle moves around again. And you just keep moving through this cycle. 10 years ago, I lived in Brixton, which was when Brixton Village Market was just sort of starting to find its feet. And at the time, there were two restaurants which had just opened, little independent places. Um, one was called Franco Mancas, um, 50 branches and counting today. And the other one was Honest Burgers, uh, 38 and counting. And each of those had one store each in a secure space where they could create their brand and create their product and hone their skills. And now they have these two brands which are expanding and doing it right. But all too often, when you look at our high streets and you look at our centers, what you actually see is retail mundanity. So, you know, we, we've talked about clone towns in the past. I actually think we've got a bigger issue, which is clone stores. Most of the big retailers who have 200 plus stores only have three different formats, which they then roll out onto every single store that they've got, irrespective of who the local customer is or what the local market is. There's no distinction, there's no locality, there's no recognizing how people differ between cities and places. 
And it's easy to blame the retailers and the landlords for that. But actually, that lack of innovation and that lack of local connection isn't solely due to a lack of ambition. Consumers are evolving and changing the way they shop, but the institutions which sit behind the whole framework are not. If you take business rates, John Lewis pay more in business rates on their Oxford Street store than Amazon paid in UK corporation tax. It's crippling the cost of having a physical store, and it's adding to an already significant cost burden for retailers. The Tenancy Act. The 1954 Landlord and Tenant Act is 65. It's older than most of the people in this conference hall. And it's still underpinning most retail and landlord relationships. In 1954, when it was conceived, we still had rationing. That's how old it is. And the idea that that is governing today's retail dynamic just speaks volumes to that institutional inertia. And then you get onto valuation. The way that valuation works is that it often makes more sense for a landlord to keep a unit vacant and actually provide space to that new retailer to do that cycle I put up earlier. Like, just take a step outside the property world and think how insane that looks to a consumer. They're there, desperate for local shops. Landlords have empty space which aren't paying any rent. There's an opportunity to meet those two needs. But often, the markets have disincentivized landlords from using that space. These are the same markets then chastise the landlords for a lack of innovation. You could say that institutions can't see the wood for the trees when it comes to assessing physical retail right now. I'd say the forest is on fire. The consumer is working just fine. They know what they want, but retailers and landlords are being hamstrung by a system that at every level doesn't reward innovation. It punishes risk-taking at the exact moment when actually both those things need to be happening across the board. We know that consumer spend jumps from online to offline and back again. We know that stores drive online spend. And we know that those blurred lines are only going to accelerate as the demographics change. And landlords and retailers need to work together to maximize that consumer spend. Now, I actually think most of the people in this room could very easily come up with a hypothetical lease which looked like this, where you had something that provided a basic rent, an affordable rent, that then gets topped up by turnover that's going through the tills. So a turnover top up. Yeah, we've got those today. But it also allocates a cut for items that cross the counter in either direction, so including click and collect and returns. And then you have a top up this based on the total sales in a pre-agreed catchment of that store, both on and offline. That gives you a scenario which shares risk. If the landlord isn't delivering the footfall to the store and isn't delivering the engagement to the store, then the retailer isn't paying the top-ups. If they are doing it, then the retailer is sharing the reward to the landlord. Now, I would wager for all the deals that were done yesterday and any which may get done today, not a single one of them even comes close to looking like that. The commercial reality in which we're operating is ensuring that it's unlikely that anything like this is going to materialize unless something quite dramatic changes and we actually start catching up with consumers because it's consumers who are leading the way on this. So if I'm going to leave you with one thing, it is this. The customer is in charge. Listen to them. Do something, anything. Innovate. Try and get in front of the customer and find some solutions instead of forever chasing the market. There are a number of copies which you've probably been handed out as we walked in of our online Halo report. Um, it goes into it probably in a lot less of a ranty way than I have done today, and um, a lot more detail. Um, if you haven't got one, you can also download one from our website. But thank you. Ed? Alex, thank you very much. Just put the slide back. Yep. Just go back I'm one. Stepping away from. No, no, oh, just go. I'm not can in everyone charge. read that? <laughs> you got it? Good. Um, excellent, excellent. Um, so that's a good place to start. So can we please get our other panelists up onto the stage, give them a big round of applause. I promise some hooping and hollering. <laughs> Woo! Okay, just me. Um, so we have the, the wonderful Mary Wallace. Yes, I am. Thank you. That's my pleasure. <laughs> IBM IX. Still don't understand what the IX means. Nine, I think. Got a bit more room? From my memory, Maya, if you, if you don't know who Maya is, then you've been in a, in a ditch all day and yesterday. Um, and then uh, Alex from Hammerson. So welcome to the panel. 
We've, we haven't done boy, girl, boy, girl, which is our first mistake. And everyone, <laughs> yeah. and everyone and, and, in between. And, and, and you've obviously kind of chosen to squeeze Sque up on the chaise long rather than the extra chair. Well, you would have probably been slightly hidden in your, in your black on that chair. Why don't we that well? Somehow I don't think I'll be hidden. No, you are, that, uh, no, no one's ever before. said that about you, Mary. That's absolutely the truth. Right, so brilliant presentation. You obviously didn't hold back. <laughs> Um, and so let's get straight to the point about leasing and pricing, Alex, if you wouldn't mind. I mean, the, yeah. the retail property market, uh, well, REIT's no different from any other uh, asset, you know, part, of the, part of the sector, has come under quite a lot of pressure over recent months in terms of valuations. Do you think that the, the leasing models that are being done uh, over the last couple of days and, and valuation methods are keeping up with the pace of change in the retail sector? No, I don't. I don't think we're doing a particularly good uh, job of conveying the value that our retail space um, provides. Alex has sort of pointed that out. Um, two things I think are important and worth pointing out is if you look at a pure online retailer, two of the runaway costs that they're really facing and are sort of moving and growing year on year, uh, distribution costs and online marketing costs. Now, if you've got a sensibly sized store estate, um, a multi-channel retailer can help control those costs through a fixed cost store estate. Um, with distribution, um, if you think about um, click and collect, that typically saves a retailer one pound per an item in delivery charges. And if an item is returned, by doing it through store, it's typically saving them two pounds per an item. And that cross charging um, from online back to stores needs to be properly accounted for in, in any leasing agreement. The other thing is if you think about um, the increasingly cluttered digital world we live in, um, the costs of digital marketing are, are going through the roof and you think about search engine optimization, click-through rates, prospecting on Facebook, they're all becoming increasingly expensive. Uh, and one thing I sometimes point out to some of my colleagues um, as a sort of bit of a throwaway line is if you look at Hammerson centres and you look at the rents retailers are paying in those centres, any retailer in any of our given centres is on average only paying one to two P rent per a visitor to that center. Now, if you told that to a digital marketing executive, they'll probably think, actually, stores seem like quite good value. Maybe we should uh, you know, look at this a bit more carefully. Yeah. Mary, you're busy writing. I don't know whether you're doodling or whether you're <laughs> writing something, but, but, um, but actually le leading, leading, leading on from that, um, Doug Stevens, not as Doug Stevens and company, but the uh, Canadian retail futurist makes similar points in his recent podcast in uh, published in, in, in August about the, the media value of a store. Yeah. Do you think that we're going to start moving in the direction of measuring physical space as a media and marketing channel? Well, I think um, one of the themes that's come up through the past couple of days is about measurement and the different ways we need to measure. And you made, started to make that point beautifully, like we were still having rationing yeah. when some of those ideas were actually being put into to legislation. And actually the behavior is still kind of the same as well. And sorry, for those of you who don't know, um, Doug Stevens with a PH, is, he goes under the name The Retail Profit. I'm sure a lot of you follow him. And recently he published a blog um, piece which was about how actually we're not measuring the store as, a, as a, a, the retail store as a media asset. And we're all missing a trick. Because if you look at the way that savvy shopkeepers and retailers are using physical stores nowadays, this is as true whether you're Nike or if you're the Greenery Cafe in Cardiff, an indie trader, they're all using Instagram mainly. Instagram is the driver to store nowadays because that's where yeah. the population, certainly uh, under, under 40, is looking to find out about what's local to me and in my area, what are the cool new products? Who's recommended them? Why should I use them? What brand speaks to my lifestyle? So if we're not measuring that, let's call it live media physical activity, that's so not a buzzword that's gonna catch on. Um, but it's that live physical dynamic, now near me stuff that's happening, that social media in particular drives that really is a new metric, and I don't know how we make that neat and tidy, but that's what's happening now. And one of the things I wanted to highlight here was for me, actually the, the bigger brands kind of aren't doing the most interesting things. If you go and look at uh, businesses like 
George Mew's Cheese on the Byers Road in Glasgow, uh, the Greenery in Cardiff, Jesse's Bakery in Brotty Ferry. You can see the kind of things I like. They're all using their local businesses, using social media to go, here's the cakes we've got today. Look at this cheese that's just come in. All that kind of stuff. Straight away, you're speaking to your audience, you're driving the footfall, your customer knows what's in your store that day. That's pretty good, right? Go and have a look at the local businesses in your area, what they're doing on social media, because I guarantee you loads of them will be doing interesting things that's driving footfall and the sales that we were talking about. Sure. Uh, I was going to say um, to both those points, I think one of the things that um, I find really interesting is you take a, say, a big regional shopping mall with, and I'm using a open-ended example here with, say, 25 million um, footfall, that's probably 800,000 unique people who are coming multiple times over the course of a year. But they're coming for 90 minutes and they've got their head up and their eyes open and they're sucking in brand. And then you think about you, your connection as a brand with that shopper versus, say, the cost of running an advert during Coronation Break, Coronation Street on yeah. a Tuesday night. And the store is just perceived as a cost and a hole which money is poured into rather than something which is actually generating marketing and brand awareness. And that feels like there's a real disconnect because no one goes, oh, look, Instagram, let's judge Instagram by the number of sales that get triggered by cl people clicking through on Instagram. Yeah. There's an acceptance that social media is a marketing tool, but this thing doesn't seem to apply to a store. Yeah. Uh, Mark, I'm going to come to you in a second, but on that point and that, that discussion, it strikes me that you need a whole different skill set within a property company to be able to start to understand this and then to adapt your existing business model um, to take account of a different way of valuing stores. How are property companies and, and how, is, how, how are you, you know, so training your workforce or you know, recruiting people to, to do that? Well, uh, so we are, we are increasingly looking at the sort of new data sets that are coming through, sort of through open banking, mobile phone data. Um, there's a whole sort of plethora of new sort of digital data sets coming through that, that can help us understand the relationship between stores and online and how we sort of maximize the opportunity of, of any of our, our locations. Um, I think it's, it's something we're sort of feeling our way through and um, again it's that narrative we have with the retailers at the end of the day that's so important um, and trying to get them to, to agree on a sort of format or a type of analysis which is, which is um, sort of robust and um, is, is a sensible starting point for any, any negotiations. Um, it, it, probably what makes it difficult at the moment is we're in a challenge market so um, people are hesitant to share ideas and swap data and get the best out of the data sets that the landlord holds and the retailer holds and maybe when the, the market becomes less challenged then we can move on from, from that sort of hesitance to, to share. And, 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 and with CVAs and other resale insolvencies, are you finding that dialogue more open with retailers or less so? Uh, I think it's mixed. I think it's probably, um, probably less so. Um, uh, and, and therefore that makes th this, this move and, and some of the challenges we're seeing in the market more, more difficult at the moment. Okay. Um, Maya, so we, Alex talked about um, hyper-localization um, and was fairly critical of the number of store formats that different uh, retailers have relative to the diversity of the places where they trade. Mm. You know, are you getting a sense in the consultancy work that you do that retailers are moving towards more local products, pricing, store fit out, those kinds of things? To a certain extent, yes. I think they're heeding the general um, trend from thought leaders that talks about the importance of personalization that it stems from the fact that retailers have the opportunity to, to learn so much about us when we transact with them online, that they should reflect that in the way that they then orient their total offer towards us. Um, the more relevant the offer is uh, to individual customers, much as less segments, sorry, segments, much as less individual customers, the more likely we are to convert. So it's, it's a bit of a no-brainer. Um, Who's doing it well? Give me an exemplar. 
Um, I saw, so I've, I, would, I would say some of the brands are doing it really, really well. Um, I forget the brand that's opened. Is it Fortnum and Mason's doing some really interesting things with pop, um, concessions. Um, at that, that stock, localized, specialist luxury um, foodstuffs, for example. Um, I think you're seeing more and more in the grocery uh, supermarkets. Not only are they catering for special needs, such as gluten intolerances and so on, but they're also now starting to showcase uh, local produce as well. Um, from a grocery standpoint, I'd call out Eat17 in London. Um, they, they're pushing ahead on so many fronts that we've already discussed today. I don't want to drag us off in a tangent, but they've got beer growlers and wine fillers so that you can take your refillables there from a sustainability standpoint. They showcase local street food to Alex's point about um, his uh, local Brixton yep. restaurant. You know, Eat17 is actually using their pop-up space to give street food vendors um, a, a real uh, leg up. The interesting thing, another really interesting um, example, they, they're famous for their bacon jam. So if you haven't heard of East 17, they're, they're really famous for their bacon jam, which they sell through Waitrose. And they've seen the halo effect that can come yeah. from that. Um, and they're now trying to use that um, capability that they've established with a big grocer to pull through a lot more um, street food vendors as well. So uh, there's um, Billy Cliff, whose famous vegan burger is now being sold in supermarkets as well. I think retailers have to start thinking about using their merchant curation skills and knowing intimately who their customer is to really start helping property owners to move the dial from that perspective, help them understand on a localized level what their consumers are looking for, but also use that ecosystem to, to pull through and, uh, and to be a brand with a purpose, to pull through those local um, products and, 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 and uh, startups. Um, and show prove that they, they are a brand with a purpose and that they understand their, their customers on a local level. I think Alex, on because we, we made this point in the past and we've been criticised by brands saying, well, we can't have 60 different formats, that's going to cost a whole lot of money and all this. And it's a fair, it's a fair comment, but then um, I think one brand which does it very well at a national level is Waterstones. So Waterstone stores mm -hmm. are recognisably Waterstones everywhere you go but they've put an awful lot of trust in the local manager. And I think localism has two sides to it. I think a big part of localism is trusting your own staff mm -hmm. and your local teams to know who their customer is. So when you look at Waterstones, you go into any Waterstones, and then I haven't been into the one in Liverpool, I would assume it's still the case, there will be a chart which is the local chart, and it'll have a whole lot of books on Liverpool. And it will be playing back to the customer, their own community and their own city. Mm -hmm. The recommendations are not done by the big publishing houses as they used to be, the recommendations are actually done by the store manager on what he thinks his customer or she thinks his, their customer is going to like. Mm -hmm. And it's a really small thing, but it means that you know shoppers are engaged. They like going in there because it changes, because there's new recommendations, because it plays them, because they know their name. It's little, just little things. It doesn't have to be a totally different paint job and brand. Sorry. My, my first. Very quickly, to that point, um, IKEA is doing some great stuff yes, with new formats Ikea. as well, picking up on the fact that it can't be an out-of-town store anymore. It's got to have some kind of urban presence. But to the point about empowering your, your local staff, that's absolutely key. But you've got to have the, den the data centralised real-time first and push that out to empower those managers to be uh, able to make decisions I mean, based on It's easy that. to give them a kicking, but um, the fact that M&S only recently announced that... Um, they've started telling their store managers whether their store is profitable for the first time. It's that's disgusting, insane. Isn't it? Like it's a sign, sign of where they are. Yeah, exactly. And, it, that, and that's kind of what I mean about in terms of trusting it. You, and we use the example, you can go into an M&S in Lewisham and an M&S in Islington, and they are exactly the same. They're exactly the same. But, and I hate to say it, all the stereotypes about the difference between customers in Lewisham and Islington are true and backed up in data, but M&S sell the same products in both. There's no flexing in terms of premium. There's nothing. No, well, I, I, I was going to say, and this will probably in. get me my P45 from IBM. Oh, well. Um, Data is one thing. But, and we talked about this yesterday when uh, Timsons were on the stage. So we have, we've got to change our ways of working as well. And that starts with auto autonomy and empowerment of the staff in the store from manager to someone who's on the shop floor. 
mean, when I used to do store training manuals, the shop, um, you know, you stop what you're doing, you serve the customer, and your customer comes first, and you know everything that's going on about that store. That was old-fashioned shopkeeping training, but we seem to have lost that through, I think there's a balance to be achieved through centralised data that come into the local store, mm -hmm. and the manager and the staff having the power to do something with it because they know what's going on in the store but they don't yeah. necessarily have the numbers to back it up mm -hmm. I just it's, it is a crazy situation to be in well when you think about it central head office have however many stores plus online everything else to manage they need to ask certain commercial questions of that data mm. but then they need to pass that data out right. and, pu and and push it to the local managers in a way that's relevant because the local managers are going to get different insight. So they're going to yeah, see yeah, a yeah. dip in, in sales and they're yeah. going to say, well, the local um, fate went past there that those two hours and you know, yeah. maybe we should bring some more ice cream. There needs to be a bit more of it exchange. I'm not sort of saying that the data is the data is the, the, the irrefutable sort of fact that we can base all negotiations on, but Central and local need to ask different questions. I'd love a return to facts, wouldn't you? Yeah. But that's where somewhere, like I think maybe, uh, where Polly, who runs maybe, who are here at the event, they do that thing where they bring in what's happening in terms of social media, news, events, and they, they share that information with the local manager of the store. And back to your point about store format as well, I think one area where the, the big traditional retailers have lost out is they are they are fixed by that physical space and something where pure plays and new online disruptors are coming in. If you look at what happened with um, London Beauty Week the other week and just before that, the brand Cult Beauty, which is one of Europe's biggest pure play beauty and skincare retailers, they set up a physical pop-up store in Covent Garden to launch a brand called Milk Makeup, which is a new American brand who had a waiting list of something like £17,000 for a blusher or something. They had, in a small, not shop, space in Covent Garden, 500 people queuing outside that store from 7 o'clock in the morning. And in a 48-hour per period, they had 7,500 people going through those doors. Neither one of those people has a store. They both have lots of awareness and presence and all the rest of it. So, what, again, what's the balance between you're fixed by a physical store that you've yeah. got a big lease on versus the people who can go on, appear here, say, rent a space of 48 hours and do brilliant business, brilliant retail, and they're not beholden to that. And, and but then that also, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about retailers, but I think, you know, when you think about landlords, the challenge I would say to landlords um, is that you've got that space, facilitate it in that way, yeah. create those local yeah. things, create that event. And we, we, you know, we regularly make these recommendations, we work with many of the landlords here, and naturally they push back as, it's difficult. It's difficult because you don't have necessarily the relationships at a local level. So there's that hurdle to overcome to identify those local operators. But mm. it's also difficult because if you sign a lease, you end up then re-evaluating the valuation of the space. And so you're back to that point that you end up with an empty store because it's worth more empty mm -hmm. than it is paying rent. Hold that me, thought because I'm pretty sure there'll be some <laughs> people in the audience that don't agree with that proposition. Um, this has been the easiest job that I've ever done. I asked two <laughs> questions and they've just discussed <laughs> okay. stuff together which has been fabulous, but I'm going to ask you now to ask the audience, excuse me, if you are the audience, to ask the panellists a question, if you have one. There's one, just to my left. Here it comes, sir. If you could say who you are. Or, I know. Roger Littlewood, I'm a Chartered Valuation Surveyor. Oh, oh brilliant. Tesco PLC. <laughs> this is and really going to test their metal. Uh, right? Well, it is, actually, yeah. Um, I'm intrigued by that latter statement <laughs> relating to the perceived value of an empty shop unit compared to one that's let and tenanted. So I think the question, I think, I think he's challenging your hypothesis that any <laughs> sensible landlord would leave a shop vacant to try and retain I, a tone. Who would do, who would do that? I would, um, I, I had a feeling I might get a challenge like this. Um, I would start off by slightly ducking the question and saying that um, I haven't got any skills in valuation. I won't even pretend to understand the detail of the dark arts valuation. What I do spend a lot of time doing is making recommendations to many of the REITs and many of the big brands out here. And more often than not, we will make a recommendation that a given store would be perfect to um, do that model I put up earlier, where you say take, have a tenant who goes in there 
as a local operator and you give them a 100% turnover deal, and therefore the rent that they're probably generating the first six months would be less than if that unit was, say it was previously let to, um, I want to say Debenhams, but that's way too big, but let's say for sake of argument, a mid-size, uh, I'm trying to think of a brand that's gone down recently, a medium size. Um, How about Matalans, wasn't it? No, something, Matalans something like really well. Uh, Maplin. Yeah, like a Maplin. Maplin that. Yeah. You, you could say, okay, this space was previously at Maplin and it was paying this rent here, and now we've got an opportunity to turn it into a local one and it would be paying considerably less rent. Many landlords would be disincentivized from doing that because in doing so, the whole, the, it, that store would then be perceived as being less valuable. But to my mind, and I understand the logic behind that, I understand why the system works like that, but to my mind, that doesn't reflect shoppers. And it kind of forgets what the point of place is, that actually consumers are not engaged by a vacant store, even if it did want to pay a big rent. But if you're disincentivizing someone from making something useful out of that space, then there's something wrong with the system. There's something wrong with the approach. It just occurs to me maybe there's some room for research around the halo effect that comes from having full stores as opposed to having empty stores. If I yeah. think about going to a high street that's only got 50%, 60% occupancy, I'd rather be at a high street where there are... Yeah that's full and vibrant, yeah. it's going to put me off actually going there in the first place. Think, Some people challenge. don't have a choice, though. Some people can only go to the high street that's oh, yeah. nearest to them. Absolutely. For absolutely. whatever reason. But for the, um, I, I just would like to compare footfall and also online to offline attribution, which I think is a, a very key metric. If you metric have a bustling high for. street, then people are more engaged with, and then you're driving that frequency visit versus... Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you're toast, right? Now, in terms I, of I think the challenge is finding some really clean data sets that can go down to an individual store level and give you that yeah. information so you've got a really robust basis for, for making a, a leasing agreement around. At the moment, <coughs> we, we all understand these themes, um, but actually, if you're talking about a certain store in a certain location, actually nailing the, the pure value of that store in that location is a little bit still like trying to nail jelly. It's not quite happening. And well, therefore, and which the retailer... Retail, which retailers do you think have been able to identify that you know, at, at the most granular level. Well, again, this, this, this is part of the challenge, is, is that's not a data-sharing relationship we're in yeah. at the moment because it's a challenge market, and naturally it's a buyer's market, so there's a hesitance to, to share that sort of data when you think you can get yourself a fairly good rental deal in, in a market which is, is, is I challenged. I, I don't understand that at all, I'm sorry. I mean, it's a challenged market, but at the same time, it's sink or swim for most retailers and property owners at the moment. Um, you know, I've just come off stage talking about Amazon um, being the absolute gorilla in the room. I don't know why that doesn't move the dial more. Um, and for property, retail property owners, with the amount of vacant property, this is certainly not an expert area, uh, uh, area I'm an expert on, but I would imagine that with the amount of vacant properties we have nowadays, that trying to do something to move the dial and become a supplier of choice um, as a property owner, is, is absolutely paramount. It's, it's uh, do or die. I think what we're talking about is a, is a new leasing agreement and, and a mm. structure to do it off, to, to make those... But uh, where those, do you start to find the metrics by which to write those uh, tenancy this, agreements? This, this, I think this is the I'm enjoying this data. argument, yeah. and it can continue <laughs> after we've had the next question from the audience, Paul. I had Paul K. Woods here of Balmain operating in Poland, and um, without wishing to sound like the morning smart hours. The lease system in Poland allows the flexibility to do anything you want, pretty much. We're not governed by comparable evidence. We're not governed by a, uh, an ancient act that gives rights which are completely unreasonable and irrelevant in today's world. We do all of our deals on a turnover basis, with or without base rent, depending on how desperate you are. We're not actually controlled. We don't worry about vacant units. We fill them, get the lights on, even if it's not bringing you an income. Keep on filling it. If you leave units vacant here because you're worried about comparable evidence, your long-term position is going to go through the floor. So the system needs to change in order for you to share information. I get to see 99% of the sales figures, and I can work out how they're operating against their costs in all of our centers in Poland. How easy is that for us to manage it compared to what you guys have to put up with here? So that's a big call to action, radical reform needed. I hands up if you agree with what Paul just said. Every single one of you, right. Challenge, 12 months time, let's see where we get to. Another question. Good, good luck with that, Ed. <laughs> I won't be here, Paul, so that was, that, that was easy. Uh, 
Another question uh, from the audience to our panelists, please. So I'm going to ask another one then. Um, so I remember speaking to a retailer, and obviously landlords are pretty keen to capture the value of the sales that are driven from their digital store to their physical store. And, um, and this retailer said, you know, you know what, yeah, we could do that. But you have to pay a portion of our digital infrastructure. Would you do it? Uh, I, well, it, <laughs> think about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think probably, probably not. I mean, the, the challenge at the moment is their, their digital infrastructure the, the, the costs are variable and they're rising all the time. And actually, I would think what it goes back to is a sensibly sized store estate can help control that digital infrastructure. And that's what we're trying to convey back to the marketplace is actually retailers are sort of stuck in an in a unfortunate situation where they've got legacy store estates that are too large and they've got growing online costs. And you need to balance out the two to control the growing online variable costs and create a more... Um, relevant and bespoke fixed cost store estate, which can also help take some of the cost pressures out of those growing online variables around distribution and around online marketing. Um, I think that's where there should be closer, a closer working relationship and a closer agreement. And, and this goes back to how we understand the value of stores and which units you know, we rent out at a sensible price. Um, and, and again, it feeds through to valuations, and I think most of the subjects we've been, we've been covering in, in, this, in this conversation about how we sensibly fill stores, um, vacant units at the right price with the right sort of retailer, and we understand all the metrics that will create a fair valuation at the same time. Mary. Can we go back to the customer again, because this is turning into a leasing conversation, <laughs> just to pick you up on two retailer examples we mentioned. You mentioned Matalan erroneously. I'm yeah, going to... I mean, I mean, if Matalan are in the audience, I do apologise. <laughs> I shouldn't need Matalan. <laughs> no, she might. So two, yeah, two retailers long, who are long, long doing, night. sort of responding to the challenge that we've been talking about. So if you look at what IKEA has just done in London, they've, got, they've opened the new Tottenham Court Road store, which actually... Do we call it a store? Because you don't walk out with a product. Yeah. You go in there to Show design. You, you, you know, can't actually transact in there, can you? Yeah, it's not a transactional yeah. place. No, I don't want to use the experience word, because then I'll have to say 10 Hail Marys. <laughs> uh, but they've opened, I think, three different new store formats across the London area, depending, depending on who you probably are, where you are, and what you might trying to be doing, whether you're getting a click and collect thing, you're designing, whether you're at Westfield, whatever. I, am, I bet 10p, which is my pension, they've got a bucket load of data to do that, but also they've got really good people in that organisation. Mm -hmm. Similarly for Matalan, Matalan, as you know, has always had, traditionally had their stores in the small out-of-town shopping centres, where you either need a car or it's a bus journey to get there, and they're a family retailer, so you might actually have kids with yeah. you. Um, what they're doing now is they're looking at city format stores where... You don't plan to go there, but you might be walking past it on your way home from work. There's clearly some very intelligent thinking and probably data Good. being used there to make those decisions. And they're, they're a British retailer that's doing really well. Yeah. They're not part of the doom and gloom. Mm. I don't have shares or anything in them. So I just think we should be looking at those examples as well, because they're bigger retailers, mm. really looking at what the customer needs, and then how does that affect yeah. what store yeah. format and what the lease should be, etc. And, yeah. et and you know, I think one of the other things here, we've talked a lot about the data that a retailer has and how they should be mining that data to understand their customer, and that's absolutely the case. But I think it's also often forgot that landlords know more about the people who are in their center yeah. than anyone else, and a lot, they know a lot more about it than they are often given credit for. They know demographically who they are, they know how they shop, yeah. they know which brands they go to. If you're lucky, in some senses, you might even know the turnover of some of the tenants. But more often than not, landlords know exactly how that dynamic of that center is behaving and performing. We sometimes use the analogy of an iceberg, that a retailer is sitting there looking at 200 stores, and all they're seeing is the top of the iceberg, whereas a landlord has you know, maybe 30 assets, less than that, and they see the whole thing. There's a responsibility on the landlord to educate the retailers, and the retailers to listen when they say, your customer is doing this in our center, yeah. this is what you need to do to connect better to them. As, 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 Maddie, as Maddie reminded us uh, first thing yesterday morning, there was a very positive correlation between Weatherspoon's sales and Ann Summers' sales. That was to my point about being a supplier of choice. I don't see yeah. many shopping center owners 
taking, the, you know, seizing the opportunity to own that customer relationship and to be the, the gateway to the brands that they attract into the store and to be able to bolster the data that they're able to offer there. Some do, some do it very well, but to be able to offer that data in a, in a mutual yeah. Yeah. collaborative sense back uh, to... I it depends think, I think on how you define is. shopping centre though, isn't it? Because yeah. do, what would we talk about? Berry Market as a shopping centre. Mm. Yeah. 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 Maybe, yeah. maybe, yeah. maybe this Liverpool. isn't just property owners we need to be talking yeah. about. Yeah. We need to be talking traders, about market owners. local authorities. I mean, when we have bid... Uh, BID uh, projects, maybe we could build that in. I mean, there was one years ago, ill-fated now, um, putting beacons on buses and getting the local authority to take on board the burden of marketing local stores via this network um, to consumers that might be on the bus passing through. Now, you might we hate beacons. Beacons were a problem looking for these estates. But there was the will. There was the intent there. Yeah. I know, I know there are some local data. councils in the audience, if they're brave enough to respond to that challenge about how local authorities might take more responsibility for data collection and analysis and place marketing. Anyone want to have a go at that one? Anyone? <laughs> I know who you are, but I can't see you. <laughs> okay, well, you, it's that, that's, I, that's understandable. It's Thursday, <laughs> just about still the morning, um, and people are a bit tired. So, any more questions <laughs> from the audience? Yes, one, two, goodness, two. bumper wow. question Juicy at the bone. end there. One here, please, and then one in the middle. Uh, Nigel Pode, Insight. Um, an awful lot <laughs> that I would like to talk about generally, but there's a couple of points there you made about the likes of Massillon. And I would love to think, and Anthony, I'm sure, will pick me up if I'm wrong, um, that their decision to go in town is purely driven by an analysis of their customer, as opposed to the fact that in town is now becoming a lot cheaper than retail parks and out of town, and it's an economic driver. And also your point about localism, and you mentioned IKEA a couple of times. I mean, surely IKEA is the retailer that doesn't do localism because their product is the same the world over, never mind just in the UK. Mm. So it's, it, it's, it's not just about these big retailers. I think the most important point you made is about the local retailers, the guys in Cardiff. Yeah. We have the same thing up in Preston with, with Finch Bakeries where they, they sell out by 11.30 in the morning because yeah. they have so much contact with their consumers well, via Preston's social media. Well, Preston's the perfect media. example because of what you did with the whole, are we still call it the, the cooperative movement with the small yep. C. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You, you, you were like, like the poster child for it, weren't you? <laughs> not quite. <laughs> poster child? I'm not sure Nigel's been called that, but... Um, so was that, I mean, that was a, a really it was important a, it was statement. A comment, I, I, right. Yeah, there's a good I would, statement. Let's, say, um, let's, uh, let's get to a question. Okay. Uh, um, my, I, to I was just going to say on the IKEA front, it just I, the reason I picked on IKEA, you're absolutely right. They could be um, uh, uh, accused of being one of those clone retailers, but at least they're diversifying their format. It's, the uh, product I, is I, the same, but the service isn't. Yeah, there you go. I, think I was going to say, the, I, thing. the thing about IKEA and the thing that um, I like about it is that you would struggle to find a more global retailer in terms of, yeah, their offer and where they sell and where they operate. But in the example you used of Stratford, if you take, you've got the Stratford store, sorry, you've got the um, Tottenham Court Road store, you then got a Stratford store, which is transactional and is basically selling marketplace in a shopping center format. And then you have the Greenwich store, which is your traditional Big IKEA, box. but they've put a garden on the roof and they host knitting clubs, which flows perfectly to the Greenwich market. Um, and it is, yeah, it's the paint, putting nice paints around the edges. But the thing is, is those three formats are within nine miles of each other. So there's absolutely data and understanding that's driving those decisions to make those calls at a local uh, level. I, I also think some of the move back towards town centers is, is the way people go shopping these days is that people less and less just go for a shopping trip. Um, going into a town center is convenient because you can do a number of things. You can go shopping for a bit, you can go and meet some friends for, for food, you can go, go and do a, a mixture of different things at the same time. Um, and, and that's why there's perhaps a trend towards some of these formats looking for town center opportunities because I think some of the shopping missions we see is, is less focused around shopping now and more around doing other things whilst doing some shopping at the same time. 
Um, and therefore, that, that sends out an important message to some of the out-of-town locations that we need to work harder with um, some of the other uh, expanding our offers into into F and B leisure, make it more of a more of an event trip than just a shopping trip. I, I think we shouldn't just look at shopping in isolation as a mission people do on their own. I think they do it less and less. I think shopping should, is part of a bigger group of things that people do when they go out. I'm going to come to this gentleman who's sat there very patiently to ask his question, and then we'll wrap it up. Hi, Simon Cooper from Coventry City Council. I'm a development surveyor <laughs> for the city centre. So given that the feeling in the room is that the standard institutional form of leases is, is broken and not working for the future of high streets, how do you propose that the system is changed so that the institutions that rely on property investment, that funds pensions, that, does, that runs the economy, it's quite a big system. Can I ask? How do you fix that? I want to ask a question Why? built on that because I don't know enough about it of the, the, the other panellists. And what if, someone, what if one of the big property owners was to say, I'm changing the way I lease things? So I look at retailers and I look at what Amazon's done in terms of, sort of mm -hmm. saying to, to other retailers, that model's not fit for purpose mm -hmm. anymore. And if the consumers go for it, then the retailers will follow. So if retail property owners put together a proposition that retailers go for that changes the who, who wants to have Is a go at that? We, we are running short of time. Can I have a go Alex, 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 and Mary, do you want to have a response? I was, I was thinking about what would Hammerson say well, to I that? Well, I think that, I mean, you're the obvious person to ask that question, but I felt <laughs> well, that was a bit unfair. But. Um, yeah, so, so I'll, I'll caveat my, my response by saying I'm not in turn a leasing specialist at Hammerson. Um, but I, I think there is a there is an important opportunity to change the system. I don't know how easy it is to change the system if, if if a, if a big landlord just breaks away and says, we're changing this, we think it's fair, and, and whether, you know, therefore other people would start to follow on. Um, and, and, but we need to firstly understand how we would go about that valuation in the future. Clearly, the valuation system at the moment, in my view, doesn't work because it takes into view only certain bits of information we know about the role of the store. Um, and until we can collate all that information together sensibly for each location, then it's, it's very hard to, to prove to people what, 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 the, what the real value is and then create a new leasing structure around that. And, and I think that would, that would feed into a whole uh, load of issues that we talked today about our relationship with our retailers, how our estates are valued, um, the comfort that our shareholders would, would get out of um, you know the valuations that are put on our estates. I'm, I know you want. I know you want to, I'm but I'm so not going to let you. I'm really sorry. Um, so <laughs> thank so you all. Me. I'm really, really sorry, but you had your chance. You're up there. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, panelists. I think that there's a general agreement in the room and on the panel that we need to have another look at a lot of the systems that underpin the sector because there is a clear symbiotic relationship between physical and digital space. But where that value is being captured isn't as clear as it needs to be in the future. And I think new models will almost inevitably evolve, possibly not in the next 12 months, Paul, I'm sorry, but certainly um, one would hope in the short to mid term. So could you please put your hands together and thank the panelists? And the audience. And, yeah. the audience. and, the and audience. please put your hands together and thank the audience.